So welcome to Math 150, formerly Math 105. Uh, I am a shameless cut and paster, so a lot of the web material you will see will be from previous iterations of this class that I have taught. I will try to catch all the Math 105s and change them to Math 150s. If you happen to see something that says 105, that's still this class. And so in fact, I think half of the handouts say 105, half of the handouts say 150. We changed the course numberings for several reasons. One of the biggest reasons in my mind is that when you say you're taking Math 105, Math 106, it doesn't sound like you're taking a high level math course, right? This is Calc 3. This is the third level calculus class. You've gone deep in the math sequence. The course numbering should reflect that. Mentally, you should be prepared for that. This is going to be an intense class. If you are not spending one or two hours a night on this class, you may want to rethink what you're going to be doing. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on, a lot of uh, homework, a lot of problems, a lot of videos to watch. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But there will also be a lot of resources for this class. So in addition to myself, there are three TAs. Between the four of us, we have two Red Sox fans, two Yankee fans. We'll very quickly figure out which two are which, but we have tried to make it balanced because I know there are splits in this class. There's also the Math Science Resource Center. So if you haven't you know, heard of the Math Science Resource Center, they have review sessions uh, Sunday through Thursday nights, I believe, 8 to midnight. We will have TA sessions on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Homework will be due Mondays, Wednesdays, Friday. This way the homework assignments will never be too big. If you have a big event, or uh, you're traveling for something, let me know, and by all means, I'm happy to change when homework is due. But math, the more you do, the easier it gets. You want constant reinforcement, and that's why I like to have frequent homework. You will get feedback on the homework immediately. By the next class, you'll get your homework back graded. You will get solution keys when you pick up, when you drop off your homework. Um, and what else? So this is a new experiment for me. So last year, I recorded all of my lectures using a much better system than the little flip recorder I have here right now for OIT. And so we're in the middle of posting them online through the GLOW webpage. For the most part, I don't use GLOW. I maintain my own web page with very primitive HTML code. This way, whenever colleges and universities jump on new bandwagons and the systems no longer work, I just laugh because my code is so old, it's fine. <laughs> Unfortunately, in order to have statistics as to what's going on, I have to use Glow a little bit. So the only thing we'll use Glow for is posting the videos. What I want to do is recognize the fact that we have entered the 21st century, and in fact, we've been in the 21st century for a while now. <coughs> the way I was taught calculus and some of the things I was taught in calculus are probably not the best way to be doing things now. And so a little bit later, I want to get a sense of what your background is, but I want to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to be doing with this course. What I want to do is I want to use class time more effectively. So we're going to try to flip calculus. How many of you have heard about flipped classes? So the idea is for you to do a lot of the work at home and come to class prepared. So I have gotten, actually I haven't gotten permission, I'm hoping the department reimburses me. I printed out the handout in color and in yellow highlighted so that there's no chance of being missed. You will be prepared for class. Okay? 5% of your grade for Math 150 will be 100% if you are prepared for class. Okay? This means you will have skimmed the book and any video you will have watched beforehand. This does not mean if I get hit by a snowplow, you can give the lecture. That'd be wonderful if that happened. Well, it'd be wonderful if you could give the lecture, but not be wonderful if I hit by a snowplow. <laughs> you do not have to be that well prepared, but you should have an idea of what we're going to talk about. What are the main terms? Roughly, what are the definitions? What's the goal? What's the main point of the lecture? If you have an idea about that, you're not processing information for the first time during the lecture. I don't know about you, I know for myself, if I'm going to a lecture and I don't know what the lecture is about, it is very hard for me to follow what's going on and take notes and process it well. So if you can do some of the processing at home beforehand, class time will be much better spent. I want to be able to have more examples in class, I want to have more applications. How many people are thinking of the highest possible calling a career in professional mathematics? Exactly. Okay. Most of you are not going to become professional mathematicians. Some of you, you may be smiling now, that's not going to be me, but it's happened. We have a history of converting people to mathematics, or to statistics, or to other fields. So just be warned, okay? You might end up writing a thesis. You know, I had a student uh, who graduated just last year, who was in Calc 105 back then with me, and ended up writing a really nice thesis on baseball mathematics. So there's a lot of fun things you can do with mathematics. 
How many people are thinking of physics? I'll be thrilled if I get even one hand. Not even one. Bio. Chemistry. Uh, the dark side, economics. <laughs> Computer science. Psychology. English. Uh, other. Okay, what are some of the others? History. History. Philosophy. Philosophy. Art history. Art history. History or political science. Okay. Religion. Religion. One of my math professors actually got a political scientist from Harvard not to be accepted to the Academy of Science because of mathematics. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to talk about applications of mathematics. This is one of the reasons why I'm dressed the way I am. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had just gotten my PhD, and I got an email that began, Greetings, my name is Blah. I'm a senior criminal investigator with the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> this is normally not how you want the header or the introduction of an email to begin. And so it was about you know, five minutes later before I could read the rest of the email, which was, I just read with interest your recent paper on Benefits Law and Acta Arithmetica. And I was such a recent PhD, the fact that anybody would want to read one of my papers was still surprising. And so the math that is done in the real world is not necessarily the most advanced mathematics. You can often do enormous applications with the stuff you already know or the stuff we'll do in this class. And so I ended up getting to go to the Boston headquarters of the IRS. They gave me numerous parting gifts. They are very proud of the fact, how was Al Capone caught? What did they get Al Capone for? Taxes. Tax evasion, right. All the other things he did, no, can't get him for that, but the accountants got him. Okay? So they're very proud about that. I want to have class time to talk about things like this as to why do you care about stuff like this. So for the most part, when I was learning calculus, we spent a lot of time learning how to plot functions. You should have a rough idea of how to plot functions and to be able to look at something and see what's reasonable, but you know, this is the 21st century. There are programs like Mathematica either on your computer or you can go to Wolfram Alpha online. And so in terms of requiring you to do all these skills, there's a real... Uh, opportunity to change what we emphasize. Most of you will not use most of the material that you learn in this class. Uh, when we get to partial derivatives, I will bring in a timer. It will take less than a minute to teach you partial derivatives, which is half the class. So the question is, you know, what are we going to be doing for the rest of the time? Well, we'll do integration, which takes another minute. So, you know, this is basically, you know, 50% of the course is one minute, 50% of the course is another minute, that's two minutes, we have 13 weeks or 12 weeks, what's going on? A lot of it is doing examples and justifying things. This is a math class. Things are not true because I am a professor and I have a PhD from Princeton or Williams is paying my salary. It's true because I can convince you. And I want you to get to the point where you can look and see why is something true? Is this reasonable? Does it look right? Does it smell right? One of my former students is on Wall Street and before his company made a multi-million dollar move, he was looking at this thing that didn't quite look right and he found there was a minus sign on. You want to be able to look at things and have a rough sense of, is it true? In a math class, we prove things. So we have an agreed upon set of axioms and assumptions. So I'm sorry for those of you who are philosophy. We are going to have a fixed agreed upon set of axioms and assumptions that we will start with. And then we have the rules of logical inference. And it's what can we prove from that? So this is a math class. I will prove to you a lot of the results. Since most of you, okay, I guess right now all of you are not planning on a career as mathematicians, I will keep that in mind in terms of how deeply we will go into the proofs. This is one of the advantages of flipping the class and having a lot of these proofs available online for you to listen to at home. <coughs> okay? So I'm not going to spend as much time in class doing some of those. I do want you to get a sense of why things are true. How many of you are familiar with the financial meltdown that happened a couple of years ago? Right, one of the reasons this happened is a lot of people in finance were taking math formulas and they were applying them in situations where you had no right to believe the formulas would be true. And so I want you to get to the point where you can look at things, get a sense of, is it reasonable? When can I use it? How can I use it? Okay? These are real dangers. So there's a lot of opportunities for topics. I'll try to draw some examples from biology, from economics, from other fields. If there are things you want to see, I think I, meant, I heard two people from art. There was at least, I think, two people from art or art history. Um, I can take some examples from art history as well. Let me know what you would like to see, and I'm happy to try to work them into this class. We'll still do a little bit of physics because physics was responsible for a lot of the motivation of the development of the subject. And as somebody who has degrees in math and physics and likes physics and holds the chalk, you know, I have a little bit of control <laughs> in what we do. Uh, one thing that's really fun is 
once a year, it's completely voluntary, we have a trip to the Rare Books Library at Williams. We have a phenomenal collection here. We have a first edition of Newton's Principia. We have first editions of Copernicus's work, Kepler, Galileo. And so they will take them out for us. And so if you actually want to hold or read from a first edition of Newton's Principia, you are welcome to do so. And what I will do is I'll talk a little bit about some of the problems that motivated the development of calculus and how people discovered where planets should be without observing them, just by math, just by looking at issues. And so it's a fascinating story. <coughs> okay, so physics, we'll talk a little bit about forces, Newton's law. Economics, we'll talk a lot about optimization. So for those of you who are going on into economics, we'll talk about Lagrange multipliers. If you have some kind of constraints, so typically in the real world, your business does not have infinite resources. If it does, you have a much easier time. How do you allocate your resources to maximize your profit? So we'll spend a lot of time talking about optimization problems. Uh, finance, so all right, I'll move this over so it's in the view. You will learn I have a tendency to be brutally honest. This is unfortunately how modern finance works. Not in terms of predicting what stocks to do. Uh, that's also true. Uh, Williams does have a zero tolerance policy. You either can't hit him or you can't let me see you hit him. Okay? <laughs> so I'll, I'll be turning my back right now. So, you know, I'll have my back a little bit. As long as I don't see it. Okay. So how many of you have taken Cap 2? A anywhere. If you haven't taken Cap 2, uh, you might want to think about that you know, very, very quickly. I will post online a quick Blitzkrieg review of Calc 1, Calc 2. This is the secret of Calc 2. What's the main goal of Calculus 2? What do you do in Calc 2? Integration. Integration. And you learn all these different techniques. In the real world, most of the time, those techniques don't work. It's very hard to have a function that you can integrate in closed form, especially when you get into multiple dimensions. So in finance, you often have 360-dimensional integrals representing what's going on every single day. And unfortunately, we can't evaluate these things in closed form. What we do is the following. Okay. We typically have some region, and we want to find out what is its area, what's its volume. Let's say this square is one unit by one unit. And before <coughs> I forget, you never lose points for class participation. You can only gain points. So every time you make a comment in class, email me later that day so I put it in my file so that if you ever need a letter of recommendation, I can say non-trivial things. So we have a square that's one unit by one unit. What can you tell me about the area of this region? Smaller than one unit by one unit. Okay, good. Which is also known as? Less than one. Less than one. Yeah, okay. So the area of this is at most one. So this is a great way to integrate. Throw a huge number of dots and look at what fraction of the dots land inside here. The more dots you throw, the more likely it is that you will get a really good estimate for this area. And if you throw a huge number of dots, we can even calculate probabilistically 95% of the time the true area will be between X and Y. And so this is a very different perspective than what you might be used to in other classes. You, know, you have the quadratic formula where you get the solution exactly. Well, you're doing things in finance, you've got you know, multi-billion dollars being moved around. If you're off by $5,000, $10,000, not a big deal relative to the numbers you're working on. Getting close to the answer is more than enough, especially if you can do so quickly. And so one of the big things here is, you know, can we estimate what this is when our techniques from calculus don't work? So we will do at least one lecture on how you do stuff like this. I want you to be a little bit aware of things that are going on. So again, in the real world, frequently we are not able to solve things in closed form. We have to resort to some type of approximation. Okay, I know you are all dying to know about the grading mechanics in this course. So... My philosophy is everybody can have a bad day, and that's okay. So unless you tell me otherwise, I will drop your lowest midterm. If by some strange reason you want your lowest midterm to count, let me know. But otherwise, we will either have two midterms, and I will drop your lowest, or we'll have three midterms, and I'll drop your lowest. Okay? So homework is going to be, I think, 15% uh, midterms, 40%, final 40%. And if you notice, that adds up to... 95%. What's the other 5%? Class participation. So by being prepared for class, you have 5% of your grade already in A. And what I will do is I will ask somebody each day to summarize what has been said. 
you know, in, in the video of what you were supposed to be prepared. I will choose the person randomly. How many of you know about the expression chasing lightning? Okay. If lightning has struck in a certain place, a lot of people will go to that place thinking lightning will not strike again. It is possible somebody could be very unlucky in this class and could be called on seven straight classes in a row to summarize what has happened. Okay? So be prepared. Okay? I will also have a couple of other options. Everybody is responsible for writing up one good, clean set of notes for a day's lecture with somebody else. They can either be from this section or from another from the other section. I will try to keep the sections at the same pace doing the same material at the same time. So if something happens and you need to switch and go into the other class for one day, that's not going to be a problem. <coughs> okay? You are responsible for writing up one nice set of notes, and it can be handwritten. And then what I will do is I will scan them and I will make that available to the whole class. Okay? You should get to the point where you can take good notes and process the math, but this way everybody's going to have an on day, and if you want, you don't have to worry so much about taking notes for the class because there will be somebody whose job it is is to take a really good set of notes. In fact, there will be two people. Does anybody want to volunteer for today? Okay. Good choice, right? This is probably the easiest day of notes to do because we're going, I mean, it's 15 minutes into the class. We haven't done any real math yet other than, you know, throwing dots, right? All right, so the two of you are on for today. Okay. If you want to do a little bit more than just writing it up, if you want to tech it up nicely so it looks professional, there's a math pro I'm sorry, there's a program used in math, physics, economics, CS, sometimes chemistry, biology called LaTeX. And it's what allows us to write scientific looking documents. It allows us to make almost anything look good. Okay? And so if you want to learn how to use LaTeX and write up your notes nicely, I will have that count as 5% of your grade. Uh, the other 5% options, and you, know, you might say, oh, now this is getting over 100%. I will then reduce everything appropriately. So if you do this option of writing something up, I will then have everything else count as 95%. Yes? Is that just for one class? Or? One class. Write it up really nice. It's got to be professional. But you do that once, that's 5% of your grade. Uh, the quiz option is the same. There will be periodic quizzes. Uh, except this, I'm not going to give you a choice. If the quiz average helps your final average for the course, I will count the quizzes for 5% of your grade. If the quiz average does not help your final average for the course, I will not count the quiz average. Okay? So it can't hurt you to take the quizzes. It can only help you. The last one is optional. If you want, you can do a project. And the project is taking anything in mathematics that you like and investigating it and writing it up. So I noticed there was somebody in political science. Uh, one of my math professors, Serge Lang at Yale, got Samuel Huntington not to be accepted when he was recommended for the Academy of Science. If you want to read up about something like that and talk about the mathematics and the arguments, that's great. I want you to have experience you know, writing a real document and just seeing where math can be used. So if you want to do that, that's 5% of your grade. Any questions on the grading mechanics? If you have any, uh, yes? Do you have dates for those midterms? Or? The first midterm will probably be <coughs> in about two weeks. And a good chunk of the first midterm is going to be calculus diagnostic, to just make sure that you are comfortable. What is your least favorite integration technique? Well, to me it's a clear no-brainer. That does assume you remember integration techniques. <laughs> What's your favorite integration techniques? We'll go the other way. All right, if you don't like integration, that's only half the course. So don't worry. There's still a chance you might like some of it. Anybody give me any integration technique? The opposite of the power rule. Like the, um, when you like add one and multiply. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't call that a technique. I would call that, that that's one of the integrations we know. So, yes? Integration by parts. Integration by parts. Excellent technique. One of my favorites. Uh, uh, integration and substitution. U substitution. Great one. Partial fractions. Partial fractions. Great one or hell? No. Yes. To me, that's the no-brainer. That's the worst one, I, uh, is integration by partial fractions. I am willing to say there will be no partial fraction integration in this class. It is a good technique. It's a useful technique. It's a powerful technique. If you take differential equations, if you do some research with me over the summer, you need to use partial fractions. 
I want to test you more on the fundamentally new stuff in multivariable calculus. Okay? I'm quite happy to say there will be no partial fractions on this class. There's one other one that people usually don't like as much. Trig substitution. So we'll have minimal, if any, trig substitution in this class. So for the most part, it's going to be U substitution, integration by parts. So again, I will post online videos and I will post some review documents for you to make sure your Calc 1 and Calc 2 is up to speed. What's nice is, uh, today is Friday, we only have two classes until the vacation. Right? So there's not going to be that much time before you have a chance to just catch up, rest, and whatnot. This is extremely important. You've got to stay ahead in this class. I strongly urge you, in fact, to get ahead in this class. Read ahead in the book, skim, take notes. Watch some of the videos before class. This way, when things happen to you in life, and they will, you have some strategic reserve, you have some buffer, so that when things happen, my general philosophy is I like to work my students extremely hard in the beginning of the semester, and then as we get towards the end of the semester, I like to greatly lighten the workload. I find a lot of my colleagues seem to do things in the opposite order, and they realize towards the end of the semester, oh, we've only read two of the six books. And so my philosophy is to work you hard right now when you're not being worked as hard in some of your other classes, and then that way we've put all this in the bank so that at the end of the semester, you can relax a little bit more. Uh, cell phone policy, you get to vote on it. There are two options. Option one, if someone's cell phone goes off and I hear it, I flip a coin, and if it comes up heads, everybody in the class gets a quiz. <laughs> option two... <laughs> uh, op well, I'll give you three options. Option two is I don't even bother flipping a coin. Option three... I'm sorry, everybody gets the quiz. <laughs> option three, if anybody wants to vote for that, I strongly urge you not to vote for that in public. <laughs> option three is whoever's cell phone goes off is responsible for buying munchkins or some other food for the class next time. And if people who don't like munchkins, you get to tell them what to buy. How many people want option A? Option B? Okay. <laughs> option C? Okay. So, if someone's cell phone goes off, you're responsible for providing munchkins or something for the entire class. Okay? Can anybody figure out what number this is? No. Yours. Mine. If my phone goes off, I am responsible for bringing munchkins. Okay? You can try calling and see if I forget to put my phone on silent. If you are expecting an important call, you know, you have somebody in the hospital, you're waiting for a job offer, a major league ball club might be ready to make you an offer, by all means, let me know and you can have your cell phone not on silent that day. Okay, but for the most part, please try to keep your phone quiet. So if I forget, by all means, call me. Have one of your friends outside class try to call me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, you know, goes both ways. The text count too, so it's like, did it? Uh, text count, yes. If I hear a text, that counts. Uh, do not text me, though. Okay? Uh, I'm one of the few people who, do not, who does not like to text. I do, however, love to email. And so... My students have tried to find a three-hour window during the 24-hour day where I will not respond to emails, and they have been unable to do so. So you can, e you can try emailing me almost any time, uh, and I will probably be able to respond to your email within three hours. It does not matter what time of day it is. Okay? <laughs> yes, by all means, go for it. Do you sleep in two-hour shifts? Or <laughs> uh, no, one-hour shifts. Okay. Does this develop from your work? Uh, it has helped a little bit. It's more, I, I want to try to keep my schedule aligned as much as possible to yours. Since none of you, I'm sorry, since a lot of you do not have the same schedule, by doing something like this, it helps me have non trivial intersections with as many of you as possible. So, by all means, you can shoot me emails and say, you know, Professor Miller, I just had a quick question. Um, is it sunny outside? Yeah, okay. Try to make it a little bit less obvious. Okay. Any other questions about the mechanics? Okay, if you haven't picked up the handouts, please pick up the handouts at the end of class. Okay, I think we're ready to start doing real mathematics now. Who is the only Williams graduate to become, to date, President of the United States of America? Garfield. Sorry? James Garfield. James Garfield, yes. To date, who is the only Williams graduate to be credited with a proof of the Pythagorean formula? Sorry? 
Yes. You know, if you have to guess, you know, it's a really good guess. Yes. So James Garfield. The question is, what's he most famous for? It depends who you talk to. Uh, his proof is very similar to the trapezoidal proof, but you know he is credited in a lot of circles with a proof of the Pythagorean formula. We will do two different Pythagorean formulas in this class. The first is the standard Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared equals c squared for right triangle. How many sports fans do I have? Red Sox fans. Yankee fans. Okay. And so for you Yankee fans, I have made sure that the TAs are split. Two of the TAs are very strong Yankee fans. Okay. Uh, we will do the Pythagorean one-loss formula in baseball, the expected win percentage. So there's a lot of work, it's called sabermetrics, of trying to apply math and stats to baseball. And so I've actually published extensively in the field. I have actually taken students on private tours of major league ballparks to meet general managers and whatnot. If you're interested in stuff like this, there's a large group of people who like to do things like this. One thing I've done in the past is I've had once a week a, just a drop-in lunch, anybody who wants to, where we talk about applications of mathematics. Usually it's applications of mathematics to sports, but if people want to do other things, I'm happy to do that as well. This has often led to senior theses. It's often led to things students can do when they're applying for jobs, just things to talk about. And so uh, on Patriots Day, that's the day the pre fosh come in and we're supposed to be on our good behavior. So that will be the day we will have the baseball lecture, where we'll talk to you about applications of multivariable calculus in ESPN and MLB. Okay. So, Pythagorean formula. <coughs> so hopefully everybody has seen this. I have a right triangle. I like to draw my right triangles this way, it doesn't matter. A, B, C. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Why do we care about this? Triangles are like the simplest geometric shape. Okay. So it's useful. When I was in California for a summer, somebody once came up to me on the street and asked me to find the area of an object. And I'm 40 years old. That's it. For the most part, you know, people don't come up to you and ask you, what's the hypotenuse? You know, what's the area under this curve? How do we, what's the application of Pythagoras? Why do we care about Pythagoras so much? Yes. I guess you could use it um, for angles, like think um, like the sine and the cosine, um, et cetera, are like based off the Pythagorean. Yeah. Uh, I think you might be thinking about the general law of cosines. Um, well, when you draw like um, when you draw the unit <coughs> circle, right? And um, uh, okay, so defining trig functions. Yeah, defining. So when we define trig functions, you know, if we have the unit circle like this, you know, here's theta. I'm a Hubble drawer, and here's my sine and cosine. And if this is 1, and this is cosine theta, and this is sine theta, then Pythagoras is essentially the relationship cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. Mm -hmm. One of the applications of Pythagoras is to measure distances. <coughs> so if I want to know how far apart these two points are, well, if I want to know how far apart these two points are, I need to know C. So as a Bostonian, and I don't mind that this is being recorded, for the most part, I hate New York City. I think Boston is far better than New York City. But I have to admit there is one thing part of New York does much better than part of Boston. And if anybody says baseball, you will fill this class. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, in Boston, you know, you have roads like this. And if you know Boston, you know exactly which roads I'm thinking about. You know, Palm Ave and where they cross as to which one is above. It's annoying. New York City, especially Manhattan, is a beautiful grid pattern. And you can talk about so many units east, so many units north, and you can specify very cleanly where you are. So Pythagoras, especially if I have a grid system, it allows me to calculate distances between objects. So if I have the coordinates of these two points, I can find out how far apart they are. And this is one of the main reasons why we care about Pythagoras. Do we need a new version of Pythagoras for three dimensions? If I have two points in space, can I draw a two-dimensional triangle between them? Yeah. Now the problem is that those triangles, the points will now have multiple <coughs> coordinates. It might have three coordinates here, three coordinates there. But it's still a simple triangle, so we can still use Pythagoras. And in fact, we can just keep applying Pythagoras multiple times. If we're in three-dimensional space, we basically do Pythagoras twice. 
And so really, once you learn Pythagoras, you can calculate the distances between objects in any dimensional space. Yes, we will need to do more than three-dimensional space. I do not think we will somehow access the fourth dimension spatially, but a lot of times, formally, we want to study things that are behaving in higher dimensional systems. So the question is, how do we prove Pythagoras? So I'm not going to give Garfield's proof. I will post it online. The following is my second favorite proof. It was my favorite proof until a few years ago. Yes, I have favorites. Hi. So let's say this is A, this is B, A, B, A, B, A, and B. If my drawing is even semi-reasonable, what have I just put in the middle? A square. And so we start going through all the different stuff. Okay, well, if this is angle theta, this is 90 minus theta. This is 90 over here. This is 90 over here. Well, the angle next to A was theta, so this is theta over here. This is 90 minus theta. The angles have to all add up to 180, so this has to be 90 degree angle. And then by symmetry, all these other ones are 90 degree angles as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the area of the big square two different ways. Can somebody give me one way to calculate the area of the big square? Yes? A plus B squared. Good. The area of the big square is A plus B squared, which is A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. Excellent. Can you give me another way to calculate the area of the big square? So one way is to note that it's just a square of side A plus B. How else could we calculate the area of the big square? <coughs> and you use, like, I mean, to find out, like, how big the side of the inside square is. Okay, and what are we calling Pythagoras? That? We don't know Pythagoras. Oh, we don't know. We it. don't know Pythagoras. Oh, okay, okay. It's amazing how much we've forgotten in just like half an hour. <laughs> um... Okay, I don't want to go into trapezoids. I've actually got all that I need here. Yes? Can you just do, um, like, half of A, B, and then that times four? Good, I have four triangles. So it's going to be four times one half A, B. And now what else do I have to put in? So the four triangles gives me this, 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 this. I'm missing this big square in the middle. So what do I put in? A plus B squared, um, no, oh, sorry, I don't know. What are we calling the hypotenuse? We don't know the relationship yet, but what do we know about this figure in the center? C squared. C squared. So this is going to be C squared plus 2AB. So we've calculated the area of this big square two different ways. They've got to be the same. And so the only thing I've used is I've used the area of a, tri of a right triangle is one-half base times height. We're getting that by, if I give you a rectangle, we define the area of a rectangle to be length times width. And if I cut the rectangle in half, then both of those are going to be similar figures, and they'll each have area half the total. Well, if a squared plus 2ab plus b squared is c squared plus 2ab, then this implies that a squared plus b squared is c squared. And so in math classes, we put a filled in square to indicate we've reached the end of a proof. And it's really good so that you can realize, oh, okay, we're done. So this is my second favorite proof of Pythagoras. Right? This is an extremely fundamental, important object. Right? Everything we do in terms of length is coming from Pythagoras. You should know why something is true. Okay. If you do not know why something is true, there is a danger that you will have something that works for a while, but stops working at some point. Any questions on the proof? <clears throat> What's 16 over 64? Lowest terms. One fourth. One fourth. You want to keep going? 19 over 95? Fifth, forty 
99 over 98. Check. Okay, 16 over 64, I cancel the 6's, I get 1 fourth. 19 over 95, I cancel the 9's, I get 1 fifth. 49 over 98, I cancel the 9's, I get 4 eighths, which reduces to 1 half. I've checked it three times, the formula must be true, so 12 over 24 must be 1 fourth. Well, I mean, I was kind of expecting this algebra is usually people's weakest part when they come to calculus classes, the part they normally need to work on the most. Okay? I'm grateful that at least a few of you are laughing over this. We will all make mistakes like this throughout the semester, okay? If you are showing your work and doing things carefully, I don't really like to take off that many points for algebra mistakes on exams. We can all make algebra mistakes, you know, try not to. But conceptual mistakes, that's a very different thing. Just because a pattern holds for a little bit does not mean it will always hold. So for our philosophy people here, your David Hume's argument, just because the sun came up every day in your life does not mean the sun will come up tomorrow. That said, you know, after a couple thousand days of you know, the sun coming up, it's not unreasonable to expect the sun will come up. But you've got to be very careful of extracting too much from a given lesson. So one of my favorite uh, people to quote is Mark Twain. And one of his best quotes is, you know, a cat that jumps on a lit stove or a hot stove will never jump on a hot stove again, but he will also not jump on a cold one. And from each lesson in life, take just what you're supposed to out of it. So again, what I want you to get out of this is the need to prove things carefully. Okay, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to give you one more proof of Pythagoras. And again, I just want you to get a sense of how things are proved, and I want you to get a sense of different proofs give you different information. <coughs> and this is going to be a nice way to introduce you to functions. So, here's my triangle. I'll call this angle theta. I'm going to assume you know one fact from geometry. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So if I have a triangle like this, if this is 1, and this is 3, and this is 2, how long would the whole hypotenuse be? 6. So, the ratio of this to this is the same as the ratio of this to this. If I increase the height by a factor of 3, I increase the hypotenuse by a factor of 3. So, I want to calculate the area of this triangle. I could calculate the area using A and B. The area is 1 half A times B. I can also calculate the area in terms of C and theta. If I give you the hypotenuse and the angle, does that uniquely specify the triangle? So I tell you, you know, here's an angle, and I tell you how far I go in terms of C. Well, if it's going to be a right triangle, this has to then come down like this, this has to go over like this. If I give you C and theta, that uniquely specifies a triangle. Okay. So again, why am I doing this proof? I'm doing this proof because I want you to get a sense of how you create functions. What I'm afraid of is a lot of you have only been in situations where people have given you functions, they've given you the problem. I want you to take this function and do something with it. You want to get to the point where you are now choosing which function to work on. Okay, so I want to be able to spend a lot of time emphasizing things like this. So what function is worth studying? This is a good function. So the area of this triangle is some function of C and theta. What kind of function can we figure it out? If I double C, what happens to the area? So if I increase C by a factor of 2, what happens to the area of the triangle? Well, if C increases by 2, what happens to A? Increases fourfold. Increases fourfold. Yeah. If I double C, I double A, I double B. So does everybody agree if I increase by, a by if I double C, the area goes up by 4? What if I increase C by 3? It goes up by, by 5. If I increase C by a factor 5, A is increased by 5, B is increased by 5, so the new triangle will have area. 
how much of the how many how many times the original. So if I increase, and I now look at a triangle where it's you know five times as big, what will be the area of this new big triangle? Twenty-five times bigger. Twenty-five times bigger. What if I increase C by a smiley face? Smiley, smiley face squared, right? You know my colleagues will laugh at me, but you know, whatever I put in, <laughs> they already laugh at me. I've accepted it. You know whatever you put in, it just quickly changes the area by that. So it's got to look something like this. The area, as a function of the hypotenuse and the angle, has to look like c squared times f of theta. <coughs> and this way, you know, if I triple c, it increases by a factor of nine. <coughs> what would you love to know right now? F of theta. F of theta. We're actually never going to find out what f of theta is. So, sorry. How many of you remember your geometry proofs? How many of you remember that there were proofs in geometry? Okay, almost all good proofs in geometry come down to drawing an auxiliary line. You take a figure and you put in another line. We're working with right triangles. Can anybody find a way to draw a line and get more right triangles? Yes? Yeah? Excellent. This gives me two right triangles. And I will give them the great names of triangle 1 and triangle 2. If this is theta, this is 90 minus theta, this is theta over here. Notice all these triangles are similar. So area of 1 plus area of 2 equals area of the original. Right? Well, what's the hypotenuse for triangle 1? And what's one of its angles? Theta. So this is just a squared times f of theta. What about triangle 2? What's its hypotenuse? <coughs> B. B squared f of theta. And what about our original triangle? That's just c squared f of theta. Since f of theta does not equal zero. So again, this is a math class. We have to say things like this. We don't like to divide by, well, we do like to divide by zero. We have to be very careful when we do that. Okay? Since f of theta is not zero, I can divide by it. And what do we get? We get a squared plus b squared is c squared. So I like this proof a lot more than the four triangles and the big square, little square. This is telling me fundamentally what's going on. That the reason Pythagoras is true is it's a relation about uh, squares, about areas. And you know, some of you might have seen, you know, there are proofs of Pythagoras where you have you know, squares drawn off from the sides. I always have trouble remembering exactly how you do that. I really like this proof as it emphasizes what goes on. <coughs> And it allows us to talk a little bit about trying to introduce functions. What would be a good function to look at? How many of you have done any experiments in physics where you have the pendulum swinging and you have to figure out what its period is? <coughs> and you go down to a lab and you take all these measurements. You can get a good idea of what's going on without going into the lab. And I'm going to end you know, the class with that today. I just want to make sure that you that out. Clock is Calvin properly. Okay. So what we're doing here is called dimensional analysis. And the whole point of dimensional analysis is to get a sense of how things behave. Okay. So here's my pendulum. It's swinging. It has a mass m, which is in kilograms. The bob is attached by a stick of length l, which would be in meters. There's an initial angle here when we start it, and that's in radians. And that's really a unitless thing. 
And then there's one other quantity. So if you've taken a physics class, what's the other quantity that's going on? Yes? Gravity. Gravity. <coughs> and so we have gravity, and we have g, the acceleration due to gravity, which is in meters per second squared. And we want to find the period, t, which is in seconds. So the period is going to be a function of the mass, the length, the angle, and gravity. So somehow I have to combine these four objects and get units of seconds. Which one of these objects is not going to survive to be combined? Why the length? Okay, why the mass? Yeah, the mass can't be canceled out. So where are my chemists? Or future chemists, if you don't want to call yourself a chemist yet. No chemists? Okay, do you still do factor labeling in chemistry? So this is, you know, really good of you looking at the units. The units will help you, they'll guide you in terms of what the answer should be. My final thing has seconds. There is nothing that can cancel kilograms. So kilograms is out <coughs> I have no idea what the angular dependence will be because radians, it's a unitless quantity. Ah, but meters and meters per second squared. How can I get units of seconds from meters and meters per second squared? Yes? So if I do g divided by l, this is meters per second squared divided by meters. This gives me 1 over second squared. Squared uh, is 1 over seconds. Yeah, so l over g. So l over g. Okay. And then there's some unknown function, f of theta. So without even going into the lab, we have a great idea of what the answer is just by looking at the givens of the problem. The answer has to look like some function of theta times the square root of l over g. It turns out as long as the angle isn't too bad, f of theta is essentially constant. Okay? So, this is why I really like the second proof. It leads us into the subject of dimensional analysis. So we have two minutes left. For the last two minutes, I want to just give you a problem to think about. And this is the very first extra credit problem. It's due, I think, next Wednesday, but if you want more time on it, happy to give you more time. Any questions on dimensional analysis? Any football fans here? Yeah, we had two weeks of hype talking about what's the odds that you know the Broncos will win, what's the odds the Seahawks will win. Uh, one of the things I don't like about football is you only have one game for going to take off. I prefer the baseball series where you have you know best of seven. But let's imagine the following: you have Team A and you have Team B. A wins P percent of the time. B wins Q percent of the time. The following are four possibilities to predict the probability that A beats B. So probability A beats B is P plus or minus P times Q over P plus Q plus or minus 2PQ. So there's four ways to put in the signs. I can have both positive, positive, negative, negative, positive, negative, negative. Which of the four do you think is right and why? <coughs> so try looking at extreme cases. Are there any cases where if I tell you what P and Q are, you think you know what's the probability A beats B? So this is what I really want you to get out of the course. It would be wonderful if you become professional multivariable calculus integrators, and that's your job, but most of you will not take that career path. You will have to solve problems. You will have to look at technical reports and try to distill what's going on. That's the skill I want you to get. This is why I'm going to have you be doing so much work at home, watching the videos and reading the book. I want to have time in class to really hit stuff like this. I want to talk about thinking. I want to talk about approaching problems. That's the skill I want you to get out of this class. Which of these four formulas do you think is the best and why? All right, it's been a pleasure meeting you. Uh, today is very busy. We have a job queue. Oh, I should probably turn this off now. Okay. All right, we have a job candidate visiting today, so 